So uh, Suzanne, uh, as we all know, many of us knew already, if we didn't, we do now. Um, you have been fighting this battle among many others, uh, land and water rights, repatriation, for decades. Um, my question to you, um, I guess, would be, there, there has been some movement, um, uh, especially in the last couple of years. Um, can, can you detail all of the work and your work over those decades that brought us to this, to, to where we are now? And, uh, and, and what, do you, what do you see the future being for, for this issue and this fight? Well, the future in this issue would be no more of these slurs, uh, either when you open your cupboards or your refrigerators or go to a sports event or a Boy Scout meeting, uh, that they would be done with. That would be the end. So that's the future. Where we are now is um, we've already accomplished uh, most of the work. Over 2,000 of these offensive uh, images and names and behaviors and, and um, practices have been eliminated from American sports since 1970. So that's the great news is half of the work, over half of the work has been done. That means there's still about half to go. It'll be easier because that first half has happened and the sea change in the country has already taken place. But it happens school by school, native person by native person, and as you see in the film, sometimes non-native person by non-native person. Uh, they're saying, this doesn't work for us. We don't want to be racist. And it comes down to that. It's as simple as that. You're either a racist or you're not. You either engage in racist activities you can't be a totally good person 100% and engage in racist activities. And that's all there is to it. How this is affecting everything else is monumental. And it's very subtle. This is the prism, the mascotting of us in, in America, is the prism through which policy is made about us. It's the prism through which most people see us as human beings or don't see us as human beings, don't see us on the landscapes, but do see us as cartoons or diminished characters or something that's not quite human and that's still kind of savage. And you have this tomahawk chop, uh, of course, the Kansas City calls it the arrowhead chop. It means the same thing. It means the same two things. That stands for what supposedly we did to the non-native people, the savagery that we supposedly still hold, and it means what is intended to be done to us. And it's seen as a threat by our people. That's a threat when you're telling people, this is going to happen to you. We're going to do this to you. We're going to chop, chop, chop you. And it's not said uh, about non-native people, it's said about native people. So all of this stuff has been, um, uh, has formed the, the backdrop of terrible policies that we've seen. Has, have, and the more you eliminate these, the better the policies get. The more native people uh, are able to be in prominent positions, the more we're able to have a National Museum of the American Indian. When we envisioned this in a coalition of Cheyenne and Arapaho and Lakota people in 1967 at Fairview, we envisioned this. We envisioned the National Museum of the American Indian. We called it a cultural center. We envisioned it being right in front of Congress so that people in Congress would have to look us in the face when they made policy about us. So we saw this in 1967. We saw the return of our ancestors in 1967. None of us were there at that meeting, at that four-day meeting after ceremonies at Fairview. We lived in Washington, knew how to make a law, knew how to make a museum, but we did that. 
we, within 22 years only, um, from that time, we had done the lobbying, we had done the strategizing, we had done the drafting, we had done the crafting, we had done the enticing and the wheeling and the cajoling and the crying around and complaining that it took to get the National Museum of the American Indian Act in 1989. And then we handed over a 22-year-old baby, really, to request who built this museum. Now, how do I do it? Here's that, right here. That took 22 years. So it's, it's about the time that the mass stock movement uh, has, has been really active from a little earlier, 62 for me, a little earlier for Clyde Warrior, who pulled me into the uh, no mass stock movement. 1962 to now, it seems like such a short time, but all of that is formed the backdrop for everything else that we've been able to do in the whole, in that whole time, in that whole half century. Everything else, it's been a spur. Every time we eliminate a mass stock, every time we eliminate a slur, we make an advance in water rights, we make an advance in land coming back to us. All of these things are one movement, just as the Black Lives Matter movement uh, wouldn't have happened had it not been for Standing Rock, wouldn't have happened had it not been for Ferguson, and on and on and on, back and back and back, and you can say the same thing of all of our great leaders, of all of our great movements. It's all one movement, looking for respect, looking for justice, looking for peace, and looking for a way through the injustice and all that we have to deal with over the many, many years. And it's not just in one area. So that's in a nutshell. <laughs>